Uh, my name is Dr. Paul Jaley, and um, what we're going to look at in this workshop, and we'll take some time to uh, look at some quotes of the founding period and look at some uh, ideology of our nation's history to really understand impeachment. And of course, impeachment has recently become quite a topic and fueled by uh, the marriage issue, fueled by several other issues that are uh, in the nation right now, there are many people uh, thinking and w desiring to impeach. The problem can often occur that most people uh, in the populace are wanting to emotionally impeach. They do not like the decision of a, a judge, or do not like the decision of some court, and they'd like to get rid of the individuals that uh, bother them. And uh, that's been true for years for bureaucracy. We'd like to impeach them all. But the point is, in dealing with this impeachment clause, we do have to take a, a closer look. It's probably 1996 or 1997 that some issues began to boil up to uh, really deal with this issue of impeachment. In fact, uh, early on in the Romer case, Romer versus Evans, uh, and then of course in Lawrence versus Texas in 2003, Romer versus Evans was I think 96, 97. In those particular cases, what happened was the Supreme Court of the United States began to take a premise that said the following, that the Supreme Court actually its actions were going to usurp the courts and the legislature in particular of individual states. So that if a state, um, you know, desired, uh, like we've had several states who've desired to ban uh, sodomy, the practice of sodomy in a certain state, then, then they file appeal with the, the, with the court, and then the court overturns the legislature. And because this is happening on a regular basis, not just because of one issue, because the issue is not homosexuality, the issue is not just taxation, the issue is not what really is clothing those Supreme Court decisions. The real importance is to then go down to the root and say, what are those decisions actually saying? And one of the things that caused this impeachment issue to rise to the surface is the fact that what they were actually saying was the fact that there can be no absolute base for any law. Or in other words, the law is what the present justices say it is. Bottom line. That the law is not uh, based on the common law or based uh, all the way back to the Ten Commandments. And um, the law does not have a fixed point of reference. Now this is a uh, this has been a hundred year evolution, and to use the word evolution, I use it in two forms. It has evolved in the sense that it has been getting more and more consistent, consistently fallacious in my opinion. But also a hundred years ago, when evolution began to be the basis of the arguments for Spencerian ethics and the basis for law, so that uh, decisions were then based on precedent law rather than uh, initial law. Precedent law, meaning the last case, whatever the last court said something was, that was of a higher authority than what a previous court said. And you have some of that to get the latest opinion, but when you're taking the latest court case as the, light, the standard of law, your standard is evolving. And this is shifting. So that now uh, it gets to the place where um, in this state, when Dukakis was governor in Massachusetts, not this state in Hampshire, but in Massachusetts, I just came from Massachusetts, spoke this morning, so... I'm now in a different state. But the point is, uh, in, in, a, in the state of Massachusetts, governors that were uh, in the state would not give their opinion on a law unless they had had a written opinion from the judiciary. Because there's a pattern evolving here that the judicial department dictates what law is. And obviously now it's become more than a pattern. <laughs> it's become actually a way of thinking. Now what we want to explore here is take a look at this and ask ourselves several questions. Uh, what I'd like to do first, though, is to give you just some practical aspects in this. Um, what, what ends up taking place is that, um, for instance, to give you an example, uh, President uh, N. Lee Cooper in 1997, this is president of the ABA, the American Bar Association, and uh, he, in 1997, was really, really upset. And he was upset at the impeachment movement, what he saw as the beginning of an impeachment movement. And he said, of course, that the impeachment movement was dangerous to the independence of the judiciary. And we understand where he was going to come from. In fact, he made this clear that the reason he was upset with the judiciary 
was because the, the reasons people were seeking these judges' impeachment was not because of corruption, not that the judges were involved in illegal or unethical activities. It was not that the judges committed treason, accepted bribes, or committed, quote, high crimes and misdemeanors according to the Constitution, as required by the Constitution as grounds for impeachment. No, he said, the reason the majority who targeted these specific judges for impeachment was because he and other members of Congress disagreed with one specific decision rendered by the judge. So here the ABA journal is coming to the defense of these justices which used erroneous notions of law far into the Constitution and basically saying the most dangerous thing to the judiciary is impeachment. They're getting it. <laughs> but anyway, the point is, he was saying, look, the most dangerous thing is because what will happen is people will then want to impeach a judge just because they don't like the decision. Now the question we'd have to analyze, are those like Congressman Tom DeLay and others who are actually naming judges that ought to be impeached, have they overstepped the grounds? Uh, is it really true that the argument coming from uh, the ABA and the American Bar Association, um, is their argument fallacious or are they really looking at a danger? In American history, there always was the danger that you would impeach a judge just because you didn't like the decision. And that was fairly tested fairly early by Thomas Jefferson, tested with the courts in the early 1800s, when there were several judges that were targeted for impeachment because of their political stripe, because they weren't of the political party that uh, the president or someone else was in. But it was, they were soundly defeated. They never became a major threat. And it was early on tested that you could not impeach a judge just because you didn't like the decision. It obviously had to have more credence than that. Now the question is, should these attorneys be defending these judges? Is there more credence than just not liking what they say? Because obviously a growing number of people don't like what they say. And the question we'd have to look at then and go a little further. Um, just to look at this, the, uh, also in 1997, 104 deans of law schools joined together and wrote a letter against the impeachment movement. So you need to hear this. They, they said the following. Impeachment was never intended to be used and never should be used against a judge who issues an opinion with which members of the other branches disagree. Even if Congress disagrees, if Congress always, in other words, impeaches a judge that rules in the way they disagree, we, we'd have anarchy or we might have legislative supremacy. We might have some very strange doctrines that haven't been taught in American history. Sarcasm aside. These deans would um, say the following. We, the undersigned, these law school deans, write to convey our strong opposition to proposals to initiate impeachment proceedings against federal judges who have rendered politically unpopular decisions in cases of controversies properly before them. So now you have the deans coming also to the, quote, rescue of this. Now the question we'd have to ask, what wisdom could we get from the founders? Well, probably the most uh, popular quote, quoted over and over again from Federalist 81 by Alexander Hamilton, said this, the judiciary from the nature of its functions will always be the least dangerous to the political rights of the Constitution. Why did he say that? The judiciary is, beyond comparison, the weakest of the three departments of power, and the general liberty of the people can never be endangered from that quarter. Now Jefferson disagreed with Hamilton, but Jefferson disagreed with everything that Hamilton said. So we have to recognize also that Jefferson had a problem with what Hamilton said because he saw that if the judiciary went unchecked and Congress fell asleep, the judiciary could become the strongest branch of government one day. Now Jefferson didn't think it would take as long as it has, but we also recognize that Hamilton was saying by the original design of the Constitution, the judiciary was the weakest. And I believe Hamilton's correct. The original design of the Constitution did make the judiciary the weakest. And the way the Congress has merely fallen asleep, rolling over dead to judicial decisions is not by the original intent of the Constitution. But it should not surprise us because the Congress is hardly knowledgeable when it comes to constitutional issues. The saddest part of our constitutional government today is the fact that congressmen are so ignorant of the Constitution, or worse yet, knowledgeable of the Constitution, but deliberately don't follow it or usurp it. Now, it's interesting also that um, uh, Thomas Jefferson, in a letter written in 1820, made this observation 
Now he's no longer president. It's more than a decade since he's been out of office. But Jefferson was uh, always opinionated and had some very, very interesting things to say. And uh, most of the time, he's very accurate with the rest of the founders. He wrote this. He said, the opinion which gives to the judges the right to decide what laws are constitutional and what are not, not only for themselves in their own sphere of action, but for the legislature and executive also in their spheres. If it, this view is accepted, he said, this would make the judiciary a despotic branch. That is wise, because it's exactly <coughs> what has happened. If that opinion is embraced, that to the judicial branch, or put it this way, and I don't have time to go into the history of this, but if judicial review, which meant that the judicial branch can review any decision of the legislative branch if brought to them on appeal and challenged by the individual and brought to them, they can rule in that case and rule for those individuals that that law does not apply. But remember, by the original intent, that only applied to that one case. It didn't rewrite law for the legislature, and it didn't rewrite law for the Congress. Now, if the opinion is taken that Jefferson says is dangerous, and in 1820 there were already people misreading Marshall's decision of Marbury versus Madison to, propone, to give the proponent, and Jefferson didn't like Marshall. So you have a situation where he was purporting, too, that, Je that Marshall was giving the opinion that the Supreme Court had the right not just to review a constitutional decision in an individual case, of course that's their role, but to actually be the supreme law in that case for all branches, binding all branches. Now that was not intended by the founders by any stretch of the imagination. But now to go back to just some basic, I'm going to go pretty quickly here, but just lay a foundation here. Um, we need to recognize that the whole concept of impeachment, long before it was enacted in our branches, was of course enacted in the English Constitution. And that had a history that went back to the Anglo-Saxons and King Alfred the Great. And that had a history that went back all the way to the Celts, and particularly to their law book that they wrote that St. Patrick compiled called Liber Ex Lege Moise, which was a Latin phrase for the Celtic laws that were based on the Ten Commandments. Now, why? Does impeachment have such a lineage that goes that far back? Because we, we need to recognize that according to Exodus 19 and Deuteronomy 17 of the Bible, it's very clear that all civil government is to operate by compact and covenant. And it was a covenant before God between the people and the government, which meant that the oath of office became very, very important for those who came from a biblical background because they recognized when you raised your right hand and you took an oath of office, you were taking an oath not only to follow the Constitution, but you were taking an oath before God. And that means if you violate that oath, you're liable to be removed. You see, you realize all the way back, if you don't follow that covenant, you don't follow the oath of office, you can be removed. What good is an oath done before God if there's no recourse? You can do anything you want to do, and there's no accountability. So this has a long history. Deuteronomy 17 tells us uh, very, care very uh, clearly that uh, the due process was part of that oath of office. That you couldn't have just one witness put someone to death. You had to have a due process of law. Those case laws that were studied intently by not only the founders, but by particularly the teachers who taught the founders. Whether we're, we're talking about uh, the lawyer, George Wythe, who trained Jefferson, or some of those law professors in the 1740s, 50s, and 60s had come out of the Great Awakening, had gone back to the scripture, and were trying to then say that all American law was going to be based on its true lineage, which goes back beyond English kings, back to King Alfred, who codified the Liber Ex Lege Moise from the 200s. A.D., which came from the Ten Commandments. And they would trace that lineage all the way back. And that was important because of this. You're going to see that's important for the founders. Because there has to be a fixed point of reference by which you deal with law, or it's someone's opinion. So they had, they had traced this. Now, the Bible not only says that. The Bible said this, that there were two reasons that you could remove a civil magistrate. One was for their character. If they were a... Uh, a, a real character, okay? If they took bribes, if they were unethical, some aspect of their character could remove them from office. 
Exodus 18, 21, Deuteronomy 1, 13, tell us very clearly that uh, unless this person, that this person has, is to have good character qualities. I'll just read one of them, just so you uh, get an idea. And these were taken very seriously. Uh, these were not uh, minor references on a Sunday morning. These were, these were sermons that were training people on how to vote. And they used these sermons, and these texts were used over and over again. Exodus 18.21 says, Moreover, provide out of the people, this is now voting, that are able men, fear God, men of truth, who hate covetousness, and place them to be rulers. So you see, the scripture was saying, don't place a covetous man. His private morals are critical to his character to put in there. But that's not the only thing. In fact, Deuteronomy chapter 4 also gave a quality and a characteristic that was used that became the basis for impeachment. And uh, Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 2 said this, No civil magistrate is ever to add, and I added the word civil magistrate, I'm just giving you the context, you cannot add or subtract from the words that I command you. You shall never diminish aught from it. You shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. So a civil magistrate in the Old Testament, if they added to the basic law, if they, in other words, what we say in the Hebrew is this, if they created law out of thin air that wasn't based on the Ten Commandments, they were liable to be removed. They had violated their oath. They were supposed to apply the law. They were not supposed to create the law. The law came before they came into office. They took an oath to uphold it, and they're to apply it. They're not to come back and try to create it out of thin air. If they do, then every law branch or legislative branch or judicial or executive can create law out of thin air all the time. And uh, isn't that a shock <laughs> or an interesting thought? And of course, it happens all the time today. But part of the reason it happens is because we have become so ignorant. William Blackstone, who was one of the most studied jurists in the 1700s by the founders, also articulated this, that impeachment involved two things. Now, you need to be clear on this because these two things is where the attack is today. And you will find attorneys, judges, and people who are defending the judges and defending, quote, their independence, really defending their imperialist idea as to who they are, will constantly say that this is not correct. The evidence is overwhelming. And I suggest you, you know, if you want a quick crash course, excellent little booklet, Impeachment by David Barton. I believe it's for sale here at the conference. And uh, uh, excellent. this is an excellent review of impeachment, and it's simple reading. You can conquer this in one uh, hour or less on one evening, and then you'll need to pray because you'll be so mad. But the point is, <laughs> it, it will, <laughs> it, it's definitely uh, an excellent little book. I would highly recommend that. And I'll recommend a few others that uh, may, be, may be good for you to, to read. But now let's look at the more practical side. And remember these two things. Character can remove you, as well as violating your oath in the creation of law. You follow me? Two areas now. Now, when the founders wrote in the definition of impeachment, they very carefully chose a phrase. Now, they said treason and bribery. Both of those are character issues. If you're, you, you're not going to work against your country, that's a character, that's an ethical issue. And obviously bribery. They covered the character part of impeachment with the words treason and bribery. And uh, when they did that, uh, for instance, I'll just read the phrase from Article 2, Section 4. The President, Vice President, all civil officers of the United States shall be removed from office on impeachment for and conviction of treason bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. Now it says impeachment, that's done by the House of Representatives. That's the indictment. Conviction, that's done by the Senate that retakes an oath to become a jury in order to try the individual. And of course, during that time, because the individual tried could be the president or could be the vice president, due to conflict of interest, of course, the Supreme Court justice, chief justice, would preside over the Senate as a jury in order to be able to remove the individual. So you'd have to be indicted. Impeached, that's what impeached means, but you could be impeached and acquitted. And uh, like when, when Andrew Johnson was attempted to be impeached and acquitted. And then you had uh, back in the 1800s, and of course you have President Clinton, it's a recent example, of the fact that the Senate did not have the, the number of votes to convict the impeachment. But now the question comes, if this is pretty clear that the Constitution deals with, now the Constitution itself defines treason. 
So in Article 3, Section 3, the Constitution says, Treason against the United States shall consist only in levying a war against them and adhering to their enemies, giving them aid and comfort. No person shall be convicted of treason, unless on the testimony of two witnesses to the same overt act, or on confession in open court. The Congress shall have power to declare the punishment of treason, but no attainder of treason shall work corruption of blood or forfeiture except during the life of the person attained. In other words, you couldn't bind the spouse, you couldn't bind the children or inheritance laws and take away all their property based on the sin or the committing of treason by the individual. However, recognize this, that they limited treason to this on two, on two witnesses and of, to an open act, and this individual now uh, in levying war. This has become a very dangerous issue because we've removed treason when we don't longer declare war. Since we have never declared war, the Congress has never declared war since uh, World War II. We've never officially declared war on anyone. Because of that, we've had war resolutions, which are not the same. You, you cannot try someone for treason because you cannot define the enemy unless you've declared war. So what this has allowed is a giant gaping hole to allow treasonous acts to go without being tried for treason. That's another whole topic, <laughs> another whole workshop on treason. But let me go on. What about bribery? Well, bribery was very clearly defined also. Webster's 1828 Dictionary Defining Words of the Time defined bribery. The act or practice of giving or taking rewards for corrupt practices. The act of paying or receiving a reward for a false judgment or testimony or for the performance uh, of that performance of something. Let me just get my notes uh, structured here. The performance of any act that is corrupt. Where did it go? There it is. Or known to be illegal or unjust. It is applied both to him who gives and to him who receives the compensation, but appropriately to the giver. Now once again, as character has diminished in people in public office, so we have seen no longer the trying of those in bribery. If we ever could know how much is done within the Beltway and near Beacon Hill by payoffs, Bribery, this is standard practice. And I'm, I'm and on Beacon Hill in Boston enough, and I've been within the Beltway and meeting with congressmen enough in the last 20 years to know from the inside that this is no joke. This goes on all the time. So uh, it's not a matter that, though the definitions never changed, people are paid off all the time. Unfortunately, bribes continue that way even from the presidential office and from speakers of the house and whatnot, unless you go along with certain projects, they'll take away money in other areas and that kind of thing. But now our, our major focus, since those two are dealing with character, recognizing that those have been diminished as well because of our lack of character, the key, co the key contention came in what is defined by high crimes and misdemeanors. Could it be that this phrase, where did this phrase come from? Well, actually it was a phrase taken from 1382 out of Europe and particularly used because it defined political corruption, or literally, the violation of your oath. Political corruption meant that you did not follow your oath in the following the Constitution. Because here's a problem. We have a, this is the, what the problem that attorneys have faced. The problem, they say, is this. If it is true that high crimes and misdemeanors actually mean that you have, to, you have to have committed a crime, meaning you violated a specific statute law, or you have to have been indicted by the fact that you are violating some specific law, well then, if the person hasn't been a criminal and accused of being a criminal, then they can't be impeached. Now, well, is that the definition? Is that the real intent of that phrase? Not even close. They did not say high crimes and misdemeanors. If you were a criminal, then it was back to treason, bribery, and the character issue. What does high crimes and misdemeanors actually mean? Well, in fact, um, Joseph Story wrote this in his commentaries on the Constitution. Joseph Story wrote in the 1830s, 1833, his commentary, very good commentary on the original intent. He wrote this, in examining the parliamentary history of impeachments, it will be found that many offenses, not easily definable by law, many of purely a political character, have been deemed high crimes and misdemeanors worthy of this extraordinary remedy. Thus, Lord Chancellors, judges, and other magistrates have not only been impeached for bribery, 
and acting grossly contrary to the duties of their office, but for misleading their sovereign by unconstitutional opinions and for attempts to subvert fundamental laws introducing arbitrary power. Now that is, is good. That gives you a better light. It means in the past, for hundreds of years before the phrase was inserted in our Constitution, it was understood that if you deliberately mislead somebody, and if you violate the fundamental law, which is not written in the Constitution on purpose, the Declaration of Independence being the Charter of the United States, the Declaration of Independence lists the fundamental laws that the Constitution and the powers that be should never have the opportunity to redefine. And those fundamental laws are the laws of nature and of nature's God. And they are immovable. They cannot be changed. And that's fundamental law. If a judge, Joseph's story says, violates the fundamental laws by the Charter of the United States, they should be impeached. Because they violated their oath of office. Because remember, no branch of government can invent law that violates the fundamental laws. Or, or government is a charade. Because you'll never have anyone tied down to specifics in relation to that. So now, if we were to continue, what else does Story say? The offenses to which the power of impeachment has been and is ordinarily applied as a remedy are of a political character. Not but that crimes of a strictly legal character fall within the scope of the power, but that it is a more enlarged operation, reaches what are aptly termed political offenses, growing out of personal misconduct, gross neglect, usurpation of power, habitual disregard for the public interest, in the discharge of duties of political office. These are so various in their character, so indefinable in their actual invo involutions, that it is almost impossible to provide systematically for them by positive law. See, in other words, Joseph's story said, we're not going to write down all the possibilities, do you follow me, of how you could violate your oath of office. It would be endless, and we would be meddling in positive law. No, we don't deal with positive law, because positive law is precedent law, permit law, where the government then gives you permission to do everything. Positive law is Roman law. Uh, and in Rome, you had to have a permit to build a deck. Do you know that? You did. That was considered tyranny. The reason it was considered tyranny is that meant you, all your liberty was government granted. You had to have permission before you could exercise liberty. Our Constitution was made. You didn't have to have permission. Not until you violated the law were you punished for violating the law. You didn't have to have permission from the law to breathe or to do something you had liberty to do. And you had the consequences. You've built a deck that falls down and someone sues you, then you owe all the consequences to that. Since there were no insurance companies, they didn't consider them that constitutional either. But the point is, you recognize because that removes personal liability. What you really need to recognize is in the initial aspect of the Constitution then dealt with high crimes and misdemeanors in this fashion. Now, in order to bring this to a, uh, a, a resolution very quickly, not only just because we're running out of time, but I'd like to uh, offer a couple of minutes for some questions that you might have. Joseph Story in his commentaries, Roel Berger, who is a man who's written on constitutional impeachment in the 1970s, uh, uh, in case you are wondering, I don't think that book is here, but it's um, Government by Judiciary, published in 1977. Uh, he says simply this, when the judiciary substitutes its own value choices, for those of the pointed uh, of the people, it subverts the Constitution and is the definition of usurpation of power. So it's clear, and I'm scratching the surface, and we could go quote after quote after quote. A very good book that may be here since Ed Vieira is here is his new book. Excellent. Just published, hot off the press. I'm happy that publishers sent me, I got two or three copies of these in the mail because they, they, they wanted me to read it, and I did before I got here, not on the way up, but it's called How to Dethrone the Imperial Judiciary uh, by Ed Vieira, who is here doing a workshop, I think the same time I'm speaking. Excellent, excellent book, well done, <laughs> thoroughly documented. Now, I want to give you a couple of things why I think this book is also so significant, but let me quickly wrap up here. So what are you to do? Okay, now we should know there's some treason going on, but because we don't declare war, we can't try them because there's some people going on right within the bureaucracy that are committing treason. I won't be more specific since I'm being taped. But the thing is that uh, beyond that, okay, now you've got bribes. Are there bribes going on in our government? Oh, yes. So are there candidates for impeachment? They're everywhere. 
Now, what about high crimes and misdemeanors? Are people violating their oath of office? Are branches of government actually creating law out of thin air, violating fundamental laws, and no longer following the precedents of the past? <laughs> no question about it. High crimes and misdemeanors are not criminal acts uh, or, or misdemeanors from statute laws. They're clearly defined in the original intent. So now what do you do? Well, here's interesting. In the first 50 years of our republic, from 1790 to 1840, 28 judges were confirmed at the federal level. 17 of them were threatened with impeachment. That's 61%. Only three were actually impeached. The threat of impeachment was pretty high. First 50 years, I mean, you could be threatened with impeachment. For what? You know, the first judge to be impeached was from New Hampshire. <laughs> anyway, I wasn't trying to, you know, lick any wounds here or make anything worse, but you know why? The judge ruled in violation of an act of Congress. They must not have believed in judicial review. <laughs> he was history. He was convicted, too. He was removed in 1803. Well, the next 50 years, 1840 to 1890, 63 judges were confirmed. 12 were investigated with impeachment. That's only 19%. Two were removed. So the level of investigation or threat of impeachment radically decreased. And what happened was, the more you decrease the threat of impeachment, the more the number of judges did quickly get confirmed. Because the next 50 years, from 1890 to 1940, 146 judges were confirmed, 23 were investigated, only 16%, and only five were removed. The last 50 years of this study, from 1940 to 1990, 407 judges confirmed, only seven investigated, 2%. So the threat of impeachment has steadily what? declined in our history, which means people are getting away with everything. <laughs> now, what are the constitutional solutions? Well, let me just throw out a few. At the state level, we could have legislative interposition. That's what I suggested in Massachusetts. I didn't have enough legislators to go along with me, but I suggested a resolution of letters, legislative interposition in the last Supreme Court decision you don't have to deal with the homosexual issue. All you deal with is the constitutional issue. If the legislature of Massachusetts had stood up with a resolution and said, in, in effect, and I have it all quoted out, you know, be it here before enacted, et cetera, but the point is, if they'd done that, they'd said, you know, thank you for your opinion in this case, but since you don't write law and the statute of laws are already written, we are not under a 180-day limit. We're not even under the judiciary. And therefore, have a nice day. The Supreme Judicial Court cannot come at you with a police force and, um, or anything else. In other words, a resolution of interposition. The legislature has to interpose itself constitutionally up to the judicial branch and say enough is enough. That's all it would take. At the federal level, Article III, uh, the, the final section there, that the regulations of Congress can restrict the appellate jurisdiction of the federal courts could be done. There's no need for an amendment. This needs to be done in interposition. There's a danger here. State interposition toward um, the national government as well. For a court to say that its decision, the Supreme Court justices are using foreign law now to determine a case and then saying that their decision is now a part of the supremacy clause of Article 6 of the Constitution. If you read, I've read the supremacy clause a hundred times. It says the Constitution, the laws made according to the Constitution, and treaties made according to the Constitution of the supreme law of the land. Nowhere does it mention court orders. It's non-existent on purpose. The supreme Court decisions are not law. They're not the supremacy clause. Therefore, states could interpose itself, you follow me? A state, all it takes is one state to interpose itself to a Supreme Court decision. The state of Massachusetts, the state of New Hampshire could vote on its legislature with a resolution, send it to the Supreme Court of the United States and say, you know what, that last decision that you assume is binding on all 50 states, it's not binding here. Have a nice day. <laughs> Basically, they don't have to add the have a nice day part, but the thing is, you realize that that interposition would stop it. Because once one state does that, it inspires what? Many states to do that. And then that attorney general of that state is held to apply the statute laws as they're written, not the mythical law that was just supposedly created by the last Supreme Court decision. What about the impeachment, obviously, or version of impeachment? Well, you're going to have to get the legislature to go along with that, just like you are the others, because you're going to be in a situation where impeachment is going to have to be 
since in Massachusetts you can actually remove a judge without impeachment, according to Article 8 of the Constitution. That could be done by simple majority of the legislature. So impeachment is there, but more and more citizens need to be in support because the Congress is very, very nervous about acting without the support of the public. And part of that is lack of backbone in the Congress, and the other part of it is ignorance among the people. But then the last thing I will say is, what about a state or federal amendment? This becomes a big issue. Now, I'm against a state amendment and I'm against a federal amendment, whether it's a marriage amendment or any other kind of amendment, that brings into the Constitution actual statute laws that don't belong there. If you have an amendment to the Constitution in order to define part of the fundamental common law that's already defined, now listen, now listen, if you do that, you have already given away the farm in order to get a quick fix. Because what you're actually saying is, unless the Constitution is amended, and remember, the Constitution is a due process clause. It does not list all the fundamental laws. It just tells you the process by which you have, make law. So if you start introducing into the Constitution fundamental laws, or the definition of fundamental laws, you are giving from the Declaration of Independence the power to government to define common and fundamental law which was left undefined by the legislature on purpose. Yes, defined by Black's Law Dictionary. Yes, defined in the sense of knowing what it is. But uh, this, these federal amendments are going to be very dangerous. If, if an amendment adjusts due process and doesn't state common law or fundamental intent, that's, that's clearly a proper amendment if there's a need to correct due process. But to, to put an amendment defining marriage, prayer in public schools, or restricting court opinions, we're going to give away the fundamental principle that opinion is not law. Because what we're actually saying is this. Now think of it this way. If we have to put an amendment in the Constitution to stop the Supreme Court, it's going to take a larger majority in Congress to get the amendment through than it would take for that amendment in Congress to just write a resolution to stop the Supreme Court. You follow me? And you know what's going to happen? If the Congress goes through and gets a federal marriage amendment, they've given away the farm. You know, why do I say that? Because what they've said is the Supreme Court wrote law, and we have to change the law. So what you do is you give away the premise. You tell them that they just wrote law. Now you have to reverse the law. We don't need to reverse Roe v. Wade. All we need is one state not to follow it, because it isn't law. <laughs> Are you with me? Therefore, we have to be in a place where we at least are, um, and I'm out of time, but we need to be in a place where we recognize those issues. So quickly, questions. We have some time. Yes, go ahead, sir. Anybody else with you? The what? You just said it. You're with me. Why isn't anybody with you? Why doesn't this happen? Well, uh, I think a lot of it's ignorance. I think a lot of it people have not done their homework. I also think that people are into quick fixes. Uh, most people do not think for the long term. And so what it is is, uh, now the, the bandwagon for the Federal Marriage Amendment, and, I, and again, I, my hat's off to individuals who are courageous enough to stand up and they, they, maybe, I, maybe I agree with them morally and things like that, but I'm looking at a constitutional perspective that's longer term. So it's a good question. Uh, we're still fighting a major battle of ignorance. Now as Jefferson said, if you find the people ever ignorant of constitutional principles, the answer is not to remove the power from them by increasing power in the civil government. The answer is to inform them with proper discretion. So therefore, and I agree with that statement, because just because the populace is so ignorant does not mean then we should justify changing the entire uh, Constitution in order to do that. So that's my quick answer, OK? That may not be a, an exhaustive one, but. Well, I, I guess uh, if you make a law that says, in, in the case of marriage, it's married between man and woman, and if you make an amendment to the Constitution, if the Supreme Court doesn't believe in the Constitution to begin with, why do people think that change in the Constitution that support the Supreme Court is going to believe in it any more now right. than it did? Well, or an amendment, uh, that uh, that's correct. Or, or work their way around it to do that's right. they want it to do. Exactly. And also, when people say, well, let's get an amendment that restricts the appellate jurisdiction of the Supreme Court, well, the Supreme Court's not following the Constitution to begin with, and neither is the Congress. And if the Congress was following the Supreme Court, one person said, not the Supreme Court, but if the, follow, if the Congress was actually impeaching congressmen for taking bribes, we'd have half the Congress gone. We, we would get 50%. One person, and this is on the inside of the beltway in a congressman's office now, a certain congressman's office, and he turns to me and he says, listen, Paul, if, if we followed the Constitution, he said, uh, I have to vote against 97% of the bills that come before me are unconstitutional. 
He said, so he said, if we impeached all the congressmen that violate their oath of office, we would turn over the Congress by 75%. And he's being very nice, I think. <laughs> In my estimation, it's a lot higher than 75%. But, but still, that's because we're not following the fundamental laws of the Constitution. So we have a fundamental flaw. And remember, John Adams said it this way, no Constitution is going to work for a morally corrupt people who no longer have any character. Because there's going to be shenanigans going on everywhere. You had a question? OK. Yes, we'll take one more. Yes, sir. When uh, unconstitution or illegal or immoral practice becomes common practice and becomes settled. I'm, I'm playing devil's advocate. No, go ahead. Becomes settled. Yes. But I think there's a legal theory that says that the old practice is null. What do you say to that? Well, it, there's not a theory in common law. Obviously, in common law, if something is practiced for a long enough period of time, you end up assuming that it has become law. In this case, because you're dealing with an oath, and you're dealing with the oath to, to follow the Constitution, the Constitution has not been changed, then that would not, be, that would not follow. If you're following a merely practice, habitual practice, and that's where common law marriages came in, or, or other aspects that were not against the fundamental law. In other words, the two individuals were not violating the statute laws and the constitutional laws to be married. They just never went through the ceremony to be married. Weren't they committing fornication? Yes, they were. And thereby, by committing fornication, you have that, that aspect of immoral conduct. But remember that the Constitution is dealing with the fact of due process on how to handle that. It's not dealing with just the punishing of, of the act. So I would say in this case, that would not apply. But that's good reasoning, because you recognize that that is what is being advocated on the opposing side that, you know, after all, people have followed the Roe Wade decision now for, what, since 1973. Let's just assume that it is on the statute book. Even though it is not written on the statute books of the states, and or at least most states have not enacted an actual state law that agrees with Roe versus Wade. That's as an example. All right, could you could use any, any Supreme Court case. Well, the issue is we face a major mountain. Like anything else, I would close, though, with a little bit of hope. The hope is little seminars like these and days like these. And hopefully, every one of you bringing nine people next year that don't know anything about constitutional law. I've been coming to this for nine to 10 years, working with the New Hampshire Center for Constitutional Studies, and I see too many of the same faces. I'm not saying I don't like you. I'm not saying go home. I'm just saying we end up preaching to the choir, and we end up rehearsing all the things we've been talking about for 10 years. What we need is more and more people to be invited in that don't know what this is, because I'm telling you, education on constitutional principles is critical. And I'm telling you this, the hope is more and more seminars like this are taking place everywhere. And more and more individuals are also getting articulate. I'll close with one story. I was in a, a certain state representative's office during one of the constitutional conventions in uh, Massachusetts. And, uh, I was sitting there, and there were four attorneys in the office. Whenever you get four attorneys together, it's kind of interesting. I was number five. Now, I didn't, I didn't introduce myself at all, and I just was sitting there, and we started arguing the case. Well, almost every one of them was for the state amendment, and of course, I was against it, so it four was against one, which just gets my adrenaline going and my juices going. And we were arguing this fact, and I, was, and I felt like I was moving the football down the field, and I was gaining some good ground, because, and they were, they were arguing against me, and all of a sudden, Someone came in the, in the door and said, oh, have you met my pastor? Now, they had no idea I was a pastor. <laughs> I, their jaws dropped to the floor. They said, you're a pastor. And one person said, how could you be a pastor? And then they stopped. And I said, and know the law? <laughs> but that is part of what's happening in America, and that's good. Because the pastors of the 1700s knew the law, and they were willing to preach it, and they were willing to deal with it. And that's hope for the future. You know, someone like me, a little skinny kid that went to college and nearly flunked out the first semester can end up knowing some of this. I had to teach myself and anybody can do it. Amen? Amen. God bless you. Have a great day.